Well, the title of the message is, Are You Swimming Upstream? Yes. Next slide. Slide. Are, are you swimming upstream? Yes. And if you are, don't quit. Don't quit. Amen. Swimming upstream, that's against everything. It's like there's total resistance all the time. Yeah. Somebody getting the message already. Well, this message is for you. Yes. Amen? Amen. This is another message of encouragement. God, give me another message of encouragement. Are you swimming upstream? And if you are, don't quit. We have opposition in this world as Christians. When we try to walk for the Lord, we run into resistance. When we try to shine our lights, we run into resistance. In our walk as Christians and as a corporate church, we must stand against the persistence of our opposition. Next slide. The persistence. That means it's God's always going. You know what I'm saying? They're constantly persistent. Like those, those mosquitoes trying to get that blood out of you. You know, they won't leave you alone. In our walk as Christians and in our work as a corporate church, we must stand against the pervasiveness. Next slide. Against opposition. That's the unwelcome influence and the spreading of lots of folks. You ever feel like there's everything? The court system, the ex-wife. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Yeah, I do. Anyway, your co-workers, your spouse, your children. Somebody. Amen. The pervasiveness of our opposition. In our walk as Christians and in our work as a church, we must stand against the persuasiveness. Next slide. Of our opposition. Woo! The persuasiveness. And the last one is the impediments. Next slide. The impediments is the obstacles. Okay? That are placed in our way. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual obstacles that are placed in our way. To get where God wants us to be going. Amen. Bear with me. It's a long introduction. Okay. It never ceases to amaze me. When I go out, and you, you, all, you all know I'm, uh, uh, I'm a young man, very young. And I don't, and uh, I'm, I don't go out in the woods and spend as much time as I'd like to in the woods. I don't spend as much time on my boat that I want to spend on the boat out there. I don't spend as much time on the mountains, which we're going to do next weekend, on the mountains. And enjoy God's creation. And in the process of getting from point A to point B, we see these creatures, everything from fish to rabbits to squirrels to deer, all these creatures, and they're all in a perfect environment. Well, they all have been made to adapt and be perfect in the environment. You see what I'm saying, what they're going through. And I enjoy seeing it. I'm amazed at all these little creatures. I love watching Magic School Bus. Anybody know what Magic School There's a few of it. Amen! Amen, I love Magic School Bus. Now he's 10, he's probably going to outgrow it soon and daddy's going to be watching Magic School Bus because I'm learning stuff about God's creation. Amen? Amen? See, each creature is perfectly suited in the nature that surrounds it. I think it's neat. That is so neat. It amazes me how the animals, the birds, and the fish are perfectly equipped to deal with the environment that God has allowed them to be in. Are you getting this? There's all this political talk about... Uh, Global warming and the extinction, and you know, but the opposition that we give to Mother Nature, the opposition that we give is nothing compared to what nature gives itself. But nobody talks about that. Part of God's original curse after the fall was that there would be opposition in nature. And one of the little creatures that really kind of just I just think about because it just kind of, it just fits right in with us in our walk with the Lord is the Pacific Salmon. The Pacific Salmon. Next slide. And you can't hardly see him, but he's right there. And he's going upstream. Okay, he's going upstream. Well, see, when their life starts, the eggs are up way, way, way upstream. And when they're born, they nest for a little while. And then guess what they do? They all go down Hundreds and hundreds of miles, some of them even a whole thousand miles to the Pacific. You getting this, right? It's easy as they're growing up, as they're getting, as, as they're becoming adults. But once they become adults, as they become mature, it's time to go back and lay some eggs. And they got to turn around 
and they got to go upstream. And see, the Pacific wasn't bad. The tide, the currents, not bad at all. The river's not too bad. But as they get closer to home, as you get closer, don't miss the this, this spiritual application. As you get closer to the mark of where God wants you to be, the current gets stronger and some of the obstacles, next slide, get a little harder. Amen? They get a little harder. And the closer you get in your walk with the Lord, the little harder it gets. This ain't Happy Meal religion if you're visiting for the first time. It ain't over because there's going to be a lot of fighting to do. I'm going to tell you, if you're living a calm, peaceful life with no obstructions, no impediments, yeah, and, you, and you have no persistence or persuasiveness or pervasiveness in your life, mm, 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 you're going to die in an eddy or a pool somewhere. And the closer, you're almost there. This is the next slide. You think you got it made. You're almost there and something stops you right in your tracks. Okay. To me, this is our life as a Christian. You see that? Now that was a real long introduction for Ezra chapter 4. If you've taken notes, Ezra chapter 4. You can be there the whole time. I'm going to dissect chapter 4 from verses 4 all the way through 24. And we're going to learn something today. Amen? Amen. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it's all the same. And if we can learn lessons from yesterday, so we can be better Christians for today and tomorrow, we need to do it. Now, I gave you the four things that we have to deal with, right? Well, the Jews had to deal with it all the way back here. Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. The Jews are building a temple in Jerusalem. And hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the, the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabil, and the rest of their companions, unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Well, that was great, Pastor Moni. I didn't get a whole lot out of that. Persistence. Next slide. So we dissected a little bit. Don't miss that there was four kings mentioned. Cyrus, Darius, Ahasuerus, and Artaxerxes. All four kings. That's over a hundred years. Is that pretty persistent? That should, give us, that should give us some comfort knowing we're in good company. Because if you've been bombarded for however long, I'm only fixing to be 56 years old. You see what I'm saying? And... I haven't been under combat with Satan as long as they have. What you need to know is if you're taking a stand for the Lord, you may be setting a legacy for your children and your children's children. Stand firm for your children and for your children's children. You may not see the manifestation of what the Holy Spirit is going to do, but you've got to believe of what is going to happen. Amen? Amen. Whew, that was, that's, that's, that's just good. That's just good. Verses 4 through 7. The four kings. That's a hundred years. And I want you to note that in verse 6, does it even say that they were attacked physically? Does it say that swords were used? No, because most of the time a physical attack only strengthens the will. Especially of the body of Christ. You know, the religion of the day eventually in Roman became became Christians the ones that were persecuted because they stood strong so what did they do verse 6 says accusation underline I underlined it you see that they wrote an accusation they accused have you ever been accused here we go in your personal walk you have had false accusations against you in the corporate body there are false accusations against the church I shared with the 9 o'clock service, and some of them didn't know, a lot of y'all do because you've been here a lot longer. But this church has had a lot of accusations against it, amen? Lots of them. 
I mean, so bad for those of you who don't know. I mean, that everything that we smoke dope behind the church, that we roll dice on the altar. <laughs> That's the kind of accusations. Because the enemy doesn't want us to bond and be one. So they try to sow discord. False accusations through persistence. Bottom line, don't, don't think it's ever over. Have your guard up, amen? We must stand against the persistence of our opposition. We must also stand against the pervasiveness of our opposition. Next slide. This is verses 8 through 10. I don't usually dissect a whole scripture like this, do I? It's pretty cool though, isn't it? 8 through 10. Rahum the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes the king in this sort. Then wrote Rahum the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their companions... The Denahites, the Aphrosothites, the Tarphalites, the Aphorsites, the Archivites, the Babylonians, which are parasites, <laughs> the Susanites, the, the Havavites, and the Elamites. And the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Asnapper brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side of the river in such a time. This marks the beginning of a letter. The letter of accusation. It's a letter that a couple of remnant accusers sent to King Artaxerxes. And the line 9 is the two from. I mean, the 8 and 9. Two from. Look at who it's from. All these folks... That are listed are nationalities. This is so important because, I mean, I know I'm just as guilty as some of y'all. I just kind of just, uh, in the past, not as much anymore. I try to find out the proper pronunciation and where it comes from. But long time ago, I'd just be like, you know, okay, the D's, A's, the T, okay, blah, blah, blah. And I get on through. Those are all nationalities. We're talking about the pervasiveness. The pervasiveness, which is, it gets to be everybody from all directions. And this is every nationality at that time, has jumped on board, okay, are you getting this, on this letter. So it's like an endorsement. Me and Tammy write a letter and then all y'all endorse it. But you're all representatives from different places. This is, this, is, this is very pervasive. All sides from all directions. You ever feel like that? You're being bombarded. In your individual walk with the Lord, you're bombarded from family, Maybe a spouse, children. I'm talking about clothes. But then also you get to work or you go to school. It's everywhere. And then Christians today are opposed to every side as a corporate. This country has turned its back on God. And if you're taking a stand for God, you can feel that yourself. You feel the pressure yourself. We're opposed, as Christians, we're opposed theologically. We're opposed politically. We are opposed educationally. We are opposed economically. We are opposed by the rich, the poor, and the so-called middle class. <laughs> Pervasive opposition today. That's yesterday, today. You feel it? Do you see it? We are opposed by all political parties, by all races, by all ages, and by all classes. Our opposition is pervasive. You got that, right? But even so, we must stand. We must stand firm against the persistence and the pervasiveness of our opposition. A lot of us have a tendency to just finally go with the flow. It's less stressful. Somebody need to hear that. That's not what God wants. We must also stand against the persuasiveness. Boy, this one. Next slide. This is 11 through 16. It's the rest, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, rest of the letter. It, it says, this is the copy of the letter that they sent to him. What we, what we saw was the introduction in the to and from. Here's the letter. Listen to this letter. This is the persuasiveness. And I know you all can relate to this. This is the copy letter they sent to him, even unto Artaxerxes the king. Thy servants, the men on this side of the river and 
at such a time. Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem building a rebellious and bad city and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be built and the walls set up again, then will, not, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the kings. <laughs> Verse 14. Now because we have maintenance from the king's palace, and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent to certify the king that search may be made in the book of thy records, of the records, of thy fathers. So shalt thou find in the book of records and know that this city is a rebellious city and hurtful unto the kings and province. And they have moved sedition within the same of old time for which cause was this city destroyed. We certify the king that if this city be built again and the walls thereof set up, by this means thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river. Okay, Pastor Martin, there's another whole bunch of lot of reading. Well, let's dissect that one. This is yesterday. Look at today. Next slide. Verse 11 through 16 from the letter introduces in his main body four parts that are falsely of the accusations. Okay? And that's where the persuasiveness comes. People make accusations and they, and they, and they work on the emotions of other people and it creates discord and dissension among the body of Christ. This lays out four parts. In verse 12, it states the remnant's record, it accuses them of rebellious and bad or wicked city. That's not true. We're talking about Jerusalem and the temple. That's not true at all. In fact, that's ridiculous to even make that accusation. Verse 13 falsely states the remnant's intent. Now you want to get somebody's intention. It says that once they get this done, guess what they're not going to do? They're not going to pay toll, tribute, and custom. That's not true. That's nowhere. In fact, Jesus Christ tells us in the New Testament, give Caesar what's Caesar's. And from the Old Testament all the way up to that point, they both, Christians always pay their taxes. The Jews are going to do what they're supposed to to glorify God. Another false accusation. In writing. Sound familiar? People making accusations. False. Verse 14 and 15. The remnant's authority is saying, look at the book of records. It's been many years since the decree of Cyrus. Now we're talking 100 years. Remember, I, in the first part I showed you, four kings worth. By the way, what do kings normally do with the, the stuff that's left over from the king before them? They get rid of the families. They get rid of everything. Well, how are they going to go back 100 years worth of archived writings to find out if they ever had true permission from King Cyrus. And will they go to that trouble? They already hit the king where it hurts. He already told them they're not going to pay you any tolls. They're not going to pay you any cash. You're not going to get no taxes. You'll see in his response, that's what really gets him. Amen? I mean, um, verse 16 falsely states the remnant's political impact. It says, I underlined the last thing there, thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river. He's telling the king, they're telling the king in this letter, that if you let this happen, they will become so strong, not only will they not pay taxes, but they'll overrun the entire, you will have nothing on this side of the river. It won't be yours anymore. Now you think I scared a king? You're not going to give me no money, and you're going to take over my land? False accusations. The sad thing that, the, the, the sad thing is, lies are always persuasive. And our opposition isn't afraid to lie about us or on us. And why should that surprise us? Satan is the father of all lies. Satan goes before the father and lies to, uh, about, to God about us now. And Job, you know, Satan c constantly. Let me have him, let me have him. Satan's always looking. If Satan will do that, you know the puppets of the devil will. And I'm talking about some blood-bought saints of God that are Christians that find themselves caught up in discussions, gossip, okay, come on, and they get persuaded, or they do the persuading, and you think it's out of love, you think it's out of uh, concern, you need to pray for spirit of discernment to be on you from the Holy Spirit to see if what it really is is out of love. God will show you. I've had so much stuff said about me personally, my wife, and this church, 
And they'll say, well, why aren't you going to say nothing? And I said, well, if they believe that, it's too late. And they're like, well, you should go. To, I'm, they believe it. They don't know me. <laughs> I ain't got nothing to prove. I go to, I go to Jesus on my knees every day. Amen? He knows the truth. Amen? Can't save me. Lies. Lies can be very persuasive. Our opposition is persuasive, is persistent, and is pervasive. But we must stand. Amen? Impediments. Next slide. This verse 17 through 24. Then sent the answer, his answer back. Then sent the answer a king unto Rehum the chancellor, and to Shimshai the scribe, and to the rest of their companions that dwell in Samaria, and to the rest beyond the river. Peace. I underlined it, didn't I? Peace. Yes. And at such time. The letter was sent in peace. Right? Verse 18, the letter which ye sent unto us had been plainly read before me. Somebody read it to the king, right? And I commanded and search had been made, and it is found that this city of old time hath made insur insurrection against kings and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. And he's looking at the recent stuff that he has. And if you tell me I ain't, I can't, you don't want me to build, you're bringing opposition against me, build, you tell me I can't pray in public, if you're telling me I can't do these things, then yep, I'm going to be rebellious. Amen? Are you going to be rebellious? If our government starts telling us that we can't pray at McDonald's, are you going to pray? Or are you going to go ahead and just go with the flow? Do you see what I'm saying? Think about this. Amen? Verse 20. There have been mighty kings also into... Here. This is where he hit him. There have been mighty kings also into Jerusalem which have ruled over all countries beyond the river. And toll, tribute, and custom was paid unto them. The king's like, they ain't messing with my taxes. You see this? Verse 21. Give ye now the commandment to cause them to cease and that this city be not builded until another commandment shall be given from thee. Take heed. Now that ye fell not to do this. He said, I mean it now. Go do this. Make sure they stop. Why should damage grow the herd of the king? He's worried about that money. And he's worried about losing that land. Verse 23. Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste. They're happy. And they're in a hurry. To Jerusalem under the Jews and made them to cease by what? Force and power. But the letter was in peace. Verse, six, verse uh, 16. Finished the letter of accusation. And now these verses are the king's response. As you, I think you ca captured. This is the king's response back. He fell for the lies. Have you ever had that happen to you? On an individual walk with the Lord Jesus. A good co-worker, counterpart, a brother in Christ, maybe you thought was an accountability partner. Does this. And the next thing you know, you got this spiritual saber in the back and you're laying on the spiritual battlefield because somebody was persuaded. Woo. You get something said and another group won't allow you to do something because they and that becomes your impediment an obstacle our opposition sees us as an impediment to them that's why the ten commandments are not supposed to be put anywhere because that brings opposition to the world you see this right the world is our enemy the dark and perverse world is where we have to go shine our lights and if you're not shining your lights you're not going against the flow you're not going up current if you're not shining your light, if you're shining your light, then there's conviction from the Holy Spirit and you have become an impediment to the way they want to live. So what do they do? They put impediments, obstacles in front of us. Roadblocks to public worship. Roadblocks to evangelism. Roadblocks to preaching and practicing the faith as a corporate body. And some of us experience that in evangelism now. Uh, we can go and hand out water, but don't, and you can have the tracts on the table, but do not offer them. That's where you draw the line. We're not, we're not supposed to take the track and hand it to the soldier. We can give him free water and say there's some free things available over here. There's obstacles being put in place. You see this today. This is yesterday. This is today. There's kids in church that are getting in trouble because they just want to say, I love Jesus. Or they want to wear you know, something on their shirt. Or they want to hold hands together and pray. And there are places where that's being forbidden.
Our main impediment to public worship, for us individually though, this is going to hurt, is our desire. Our desire. Our main impediment to evangelism, for us personally, is our discomfort. Our main impediment to preaching and practicing our faith is laziness, complacency, and comfort. And just telling it like it is. It is what it is. Facing opposition wasn't something that only the remnant had to deal with. Opposition is something we all face individually and we face as a corporate body. We have to face it as individuals daily. You and me. We must stand against the persistence of our opposition and the pervasiveness and the persuasiveness and the impediments. We have to stand firm. Throughout history, political peace has always come to the expense of the Jews. And future political peace is going to be at the expense of the Jews and the Christians. Are you ready? Stand firm. Well, that's great. Thank you, Pastor. What do we got to do? Well, what do we do? I mean, that's a good battle cry, but well, it's really simple. It's just sometimes it's not as... Not as easy as it sounds. Next slide. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. And, I, and, and, and I'm emphasizing on 10. That's why it's bolded and, and, and underlined. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Say, in the power of His might. I'm going to go to the mortuary. Say, in the power of His might. Glory to God. But on the whole armor of, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness over this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Say in the power of His might again. In the power of His might. Amen. How can you stand against the opposition that comes in your life, individual life, or in the corporate life of the body of Christ, how can we stand against the opposition that will come against this church, in the, this church and, and, and the whole body of Christ? We will stand by being strong in the Lord. Stand in the might, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to claim your authority in God the Father. Amen? Amen. You have to claim the victory in the Son, Jesus Christ. And you have to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You got that, right? Yeah. Relying on the power of His might against the wiles of our opposition, Satan. You know him. Um, If you're not having any resistance in your life, you need to evaluate if you're really going against doing what you're supposed to be doing. Do you understand? But when you do go against it long enough, if you don't have the power of His might, you're going to quit. I don't want you to quit. I want you to hit it head on. Amen? This is the last verse of uh, Ezra chapter 4. Then cease the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. Isn't that a sad verse? So it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The persistence, the pervasiveness, the, per the, the, the uh, persuasive, per persuasiveness, and the impediment finally took its toll. But they were relying on the authority of Cyrus, Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, and Darius, not God. Listen, I opened up with an introduction about salmon. Do you realize a lot of those salmon never make it to where they're supposed to be going? You know, a sister shared with me before, right after church. She said, uh, "She said, you know, it's also like a." Uh, once we become mature in the Lord, we go and share the love of Jesus Christ and we go and we give birth 
to other Christians by just letting our light shine. But we got to get to go where God wants us to go to give that birth. You see? And some of these salmon give up before they get to where they're supposed to go. And you know what happens to those salmon? They find themselves in a nice little calm eddy or a little pool. And when they're a little cool, they come a little bit closer to the top. When they get a little hot, they go to the bottom. And they live a calm, peaceful life. And they die, never accomplishing what God called them to do, which was to get there and have some more eggs. Do you see what I'm saying? It's in our life. We are to keep going against the resistance and let our light shine in this dark and perverse world to people that don't know Jesus Christ. That's what's important. But all these things come against us. All these things. I know that probably hurt because some of us... I mean, I actually... It's not a doomsday, but the thing is, is if everything's just going perfect and everything's calm, you probably ain't stirring enough up. Because if your presence is filled with the Holy Spirit spilling out, then a conviction of the Holy Spirit will be on individuals not living the lifestyle they should. You haven't got to be... You don't have to take some Bible and start beating on and tell people they're wrong. Your presence will make them feel uncomfortable. That's enough. Just show the love after that. When they start saying something like, well, man, I'm just a little bit... I'm sorry, I didn't know you. That's not... That's all right, brother. I love you. It's okay. It's just saying, well, you should have. <laughs> and then you go get on your internet porn later. Huh? Hello, somebody need to hear that. Amen. Glory to God. The thing is, is we all got to keep going. Are you ready? Last slide. It's the same one. It's just in the power of His might. You got to have the Holy Spirit. Okay? And that's with an intimate relationship with the Lord. Okay? And when the opposition comes to you, it's going to come today. When the opposition comes to you, you stand on the authority of who? God the Father. Amen. And what do you claim? The victory in our Son Jesus, in His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, right? We claim that victory. And how do you stand? In the power of His might, the Holy Spirit. And you cannot fail. You cannot fail. Whew. You ready to stand? And face the opposition today. Whoo! Glory to God. Brother, you're ready to stand in the opposition today. Glory to God. Amen. 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 Then you quit looking at the problem and look at Jesus. Stand with Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Call on Jesus today. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for a short and powerful message. Lord, right now, so many of us can relate to every one of these things. And you, your word says, today, yesterday, and tomorrow, we know your living word is here so we can learn from that. And Father God, the, the persistence that we all deal with, some of us individually and the church is a corporate for sure. And Lord, the, the pervasiveness of everything around us already. Lord, we need your help. We cannot do it on our own. We know that all we'll do is end up in that eddy uh, that, 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 that calm pool in reservation, just waiting to die. So Lord, we just ask you to give us an extra fire in our spirit to stand against that. The persistence, the pervasiveness, and, the, and the, oh, the persuasiveness. Father God, right now, there's a lot of us that deal with that just from our own brothers and sisters in Christ because the people don't realize when they're being used by our arch enemy, Satan. Lord, give us the wisdom and the discernment. Touch us with the Holy Spirit during those times. And finally, Lord, those physical, those mental, those emotional and those spiritual impediments, those obstructions that try to get in our way, we bind those up as corporate today and individually to, as we leave this place. We bind them up, Lord, and we just ask you right now to give us the divine wisdom on how to, uh, to breach that obstacle, to get through, and to continue to go upstream Serving you always. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.